Hey folks, thanks for joining us here at the Punisher War Journal. I just wanted to remind you that this is TVMA and the checkbox has been marked. So, word of warning, if you got the babies in the car, might not be the time to listen right now. But I'm glad you're here and hopefully you get something out of it and you have some fun with it. I guarantee you'll meet up at the suicide bomb at hell, bomb, loose, hell. Welcome to the Punisher War Journal. My name is Mose. I am joined again this time by my colleagues who, you know, fight the elements and are a part of this and making their making their mark. They are, in no particular order, Devin Higgins. You know, you would think with all those monitors, Micro would have found a way to pirate cable by now. That's right. Eric Scott. The guilty must be punished. Every time. Jason Johnson. I'm glad to be here, and all it cost me was an eye. And Sean Shibley. Those jerks took my favorite Greek uh, mythology trivia piece. Well, it happens. We, you know, there's it's it's contentious. It, it's it's what we what we do. And speaking of contentious, uh, this block of four through six uh, is probably. It could be considered one of the more contentious parts, and I also saw it as um, a great warming up to the second act of The Punisher, and probably some points at which people who would armchair critic The Punisher, this is probably where they did a lot of their poking and prodding um, about some of the subplots that are going on, and we do get quite a few and and some very important ones as well so um let me just do a little round table and let's say starting with devin because you had just happened to be top of my list uh some quick impressions of this brick of episodes well i think part of it is that they do spend a lot more time concentrating on the world around Frank and Micro and the the three main characters that we've really come to know, Frank, Micro, Madani, and kind of how they are interplaying with the the with New York as they are experiencing it. You know, we get to see a little bit behind the curtain of what's happening with Madani at Homeland Security. We see more of Frank's development with Micro and then Micro trying to by proxy use Frank as a way to both keep his family in check and to keep them alive. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, with Lewis and the secondary characters, Curtis, uh, O'Connor. So this is really the time where they have to reinforce the world that Frank is going to be operating through over the next seven episodes. And it gave you a chance for more character dynamic and less about what a lot of people were really ticked off about, uh, or at least some of the, the major critiques of the series that I've read, which is, well, it's all blood porn, it's all gratuitous violence, it's all just ill-timed stuff with everything that's going on in the world right now. And actually, if you look at these three episodes especially, they're very lean in terms of what you get by violence output, but they're very rich in what you get in terms of story output. That's, that's what I thought. Ooh, I like it. Eric, what's your thought? Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with what, what Devin was saying. It, you know, this isn't all blood porn. It's it's more like character development. You know, how the different characters are dealing with the various losses that they've happened to you know to them. Uh, but you know, there are the, you know the, the, the set pieces of you know Frank doing what Frank does. You know. But overall, I mean, uh, I think I said it in the Slack that, you know, so far, you know, halfway through the, the season, I mean, it, it just keeps bringing it. It just keeps getting better and better. There hasn't really been that kind of half to three quarters of the way slump like the other Marvel series have had so far. Uh, I thought the exact same thing, because this is usually, even in the case of some of the the, the bigger ones, or the I should say the bigger ones, the first ones, like the Daredevil. This was this is exactly where a lot of these um, 
series seem to have kind of little pockets of of issues or it's very much filler um but yeah you're right it 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 keeps kind of kind of upping the stakes a little bit and not letting you off the hook there i don't ever feel bored i i didn't feel bored at all in in these three as as at all jason what's your thought well i'll I'll echo that same thing about how you know, it's keeping a really good pace. But I'll also mention that one of the things I think they successfully done in this series that they didn't do in some of the others is make you really care and have interest in the side characters or the you know peripheral characters around Frank. Um, I mean, we spent a good bit of one of the episodes with Frank, you know, recovering and unconscious, and and yet you still were interested, engaged, and you weren't just kind of biding time until he came back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's been pretty impressive to me, just the fact that they can keep that that level of interest as they they move forward at such a fast pace. Sean, your thoughts? Well, a lot of what I think has been echoed. Uh, Two things that really stood out to me. I I like uh, Frank and Micro's relationship because it's contentious. Um, In a lesser story, they would have got past their initial contention and then just be perfectly simpatico. Yes. Which... Which doesn't make sense. You know, these are still two very paranoid people with similar but not identical goals. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, um, I mean, they work together, but begrudgingly. So my second big contention was the mechanics of the heroin smuggling. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, It seemed a little cartoonish in its gruesomeness and circuitousness. You know, it seemed like there probably are simpler ways for people with that much power to smuggle heroin in from Afghanistan. Um, It just felt like we need to show these guys are super evil. Like, they're super evil. They're so evil that they don't even respect the corpses of our fallen soldiers, right? Right. May as well kick some puppies while they're at it, you know? Sure. So, I just, I thought that was a little yeah, little much. I I, I gotta say, there are I do have one big like issue plot point story wise that it, and, it's, and it was in this episode um you know resupply i i love the titling of of these of uh, of each of these episodes because they give a little bit of a clue in as a good title would but i mean this is um frank and micro working to get supplied and it come it you know opens up with you know very much a uh, a kind of a tongue in cheek uh, we get to see Turk, who we've seen in many different uh, Marvel properties now. Um, and Turk doesn't have anything but a pink Ruger. And obviously that pisses Frank off because this was this was supposed to be a, a gathering of, of weapons. And so they've got to look for something bigger. And the bigger thing is Milani's bust with the Greeks. And the the issue where... Um, I, I, I really had a bugaboo. I understand narratively that Madani and Frank have to meet and she has to learn that he's alive. However, this whole idea of her going rogue and then having a chicken fight, I just, I was like, I, I, it was, it was stimulating, but it, it really served me no purpose. It was like the one kind of thing in these triples that really kind of bugged me. Well, and to my point on that is there's got to be some easier way to resupply than go against the DHS sting operation. I mean, there's no other bunker of guns somewhere to rob. I mean, that, I mean, didn't, didn't, uh, Frank kill like half the gangs in New York. I'm sure their guns are up for grabs. Yeah. I I mean, I think we, if we start to look at it logically, we always are going to find a hole in the, in the proverbial superhero world. And so there's that suspension of disbelief. However, I think because this one seems to ground itself so well as a non powered human being that if you, if you're, if you're going to say this is, this is in reality that you understand, then you have to kind of, you know, uh, have points that that work inside of that. Yeah, I, th- I think it was it was kind of harmful in my view uh, with that reality approach to know that this is really just because the plot said that Frank and Madani had to cross paths right. at some point. Yeah, yeah. My my general philosophy on suspension of disbelief, which I'm, I I t- is 
if I find myself questioning it while I'm watching it, then it's not suspension of disbelief. It's bad storytelling. You know what I mean? Like if I pick it apart later, that's something else. Right. I, I totally and, agree. Uh, yeah, and I was thinking about that with the that whole chase at the end. For me, I was going back watching it a second time. I went, "Oh, I get it. This is your Daredevil scene. This is your long, drawn out fight at the end of the episode, like we had in episode two of season one and episode three in the stairwell with Frank in season two. Except instead of being in a hallway or being uh, going between doors, they're doing this in two souped up Mustangs." I did like the fact that there was, again, and this has been something that's been interesting throughout both Punisher and some of the other Marvel series, that when you have these scenes like that, they don't drop in like the heavy-duty soundtrack or anything. The engines give you the soundtrack. I liked that bit of it, but it did seem to be a bit of just, we need a big action scene here, let's do this. And then the fact that you get Madani getting t-boned by uh micro in the van at the end was one of those where especially when you roll into season or uh, episode five i was like wait a minute she, with how banged up she was i would i would, would have been very curious to see okay she's not shaking that off the next day and getting up and going back to work she was really really beat up and uh building on that 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 sex scene with her and uh at, right after she was so badly hurt, uh, and yeah, up. I had a, I had a kind of hard time thinking that's how things would play out. Uh, yeah, I did too. I, you know, n- number one, um, I've never cracked a rib, but I have seen how ribs are bandaged after you bang your ribs up, and they usually just don't, uh, you know, very neatly cover the breasts, um, and in such a interesting and sexual way. And those bruises looked horrific. And I'm just thinking, you know, yeah, it's you have to have that. I guess you have to have that sex scene to build on the Billy and 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 Madani are getting together and getting closer. It just you know, it was just odd. It, It just didn't feel exactly right. Well, not to jump ahead to that scene, but uh, that that whole relationship with them makes me think that the whole thing was a contrived plot on her part. I don't I don't know that there was actually any legitimate interest. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing because she kind of like conveni- conveniently leaves her case files lying out while they're you know doing their, their little business, and he just happens to read them, and he's like, oh, and he's like, oh, maybe Frank is alive, or you know, whatever. The, the first time he calls her, she actually just flips the phone over. You know, it wasn't she wasn't ready yet for that part of her plan. But but when it's convenient, you know. Yeah, it, it's I don't I, I, I genuinely think that this is not n- neither one of them are trying to soak each other for information. But I can't necessarily trust Madani on that. But it doesn't she has not shown us that she would use like sex as a weapon to get information. It doesn't seem like that, but there are definitely, it's like, I'm going to leave a file out and that's, you know, and, but we get to see, I think the reason that's out is so that we can see that Billy is very, um, uh, he, he, he trusts Frank a lot. He misses Frank because he believes Frank's dead. And so we're supposed to get out of that scene, the fact that he would be loyal to frank no matter what and if you're in, you're investigating him then that's going to that then that's upsetting to me well and uh something i kind of like is on both sides like frank like you know point and blank rejects even the idea that any of his former teammates would be you know bad um he just he can't accept it and uh, this even kind of plays out a little bit. I'm going to jump ahead when you know uh, Billy offers Frank kind of a way out. Very true. I mean, it seems as like you know, and in fact, Madani says that she says, "I think if you knew he was alive, I don't think you would be helping me. I think you would be helping him." And that setup, and again, these are these little intricate plot points that set up has a stunning payoff at the end of uh, episode six, which 
um, let's just go ahead and say it, we find out that there not only was the colonel uh, of the mortuary involved, but Billy Russo is also involved. And we and we knew Billy Russo was the bad guy. He's been labeled as Jigsaw, so it's not like we didn't know this was coming that he was the bad guy. But it was it was a a very good payoff that this guy we, we saw what we thought was loyalty and what we thought was friendship and brotherhood. Uh, actually, in the case of uh, of his finances, he's willing to potentially kill Frank. Right. The, the, they were the two like lieutenants that, that schooned over had in charge of everything. So, of course, Frank, you know, has the, the change of heart and the change of mind. So, of course, to make it, you know, that much more you know, dramatic tension, of course, Billy would have to be the one that would be in on it and might, you know, turn on Frank or whatever. Yeah, it was interesting for me when I started watching this and, and even from from episode one, going through and seeing when I realized that Ben Barnes plays Billy, it was like, okay, having just seen him in Westworld as the buddy of the protagonist in that Logan, it was like, and he looks exactly the same. I mean, you slap a cowboy hat on him instead of an army helmet and it's the same guy. I was just like, Oh, of course you're the bad guy. You're going to be the bad guy in this. I, I understand how this is going to work. So, but yeah, I, I think so far in terms of the, the storytelling Madani's arc is the weakest to me because she's so sporadic. I mean, she's going by the, well, I have to go rogue in order to catch Frank, or we've, well, we've got to go by the book to catch Frank, or by, you know, she'll try and be clandestine to, to work through Billy and, and using sex as an angle to be able to get the information that she wants. And it's like, okay, I, you would think, being a, a, a government agent especially, that your key to, to getting the job done would be consistency and not being so up and down and left and right all the time. And her relationship with Raffi reflects that where Raffi's looking at her going, what are you doing? You know, we, we don't do this sort of stuff. And, and he is very much the, the, the older, wiser counsel. And, and there was one point where I know he mentioned to her that the, um, you know, the greater good versus the injustices made in the pursuit of it, you know, keep your eye on what, on what we're supposed to be doing. But in that same conversation, he said, but I'm not your babysitter either. So there's that, that inconsistency of character between pretty much everybody on the government side, where you're, as you have Frank, who is incredibly stable, micro, who is incredibly stable because they both have the same goal. Well, and for an SAC, she has very bad people skills. That's one of the things I was kind of amazed by is to get to that point in a career where you're not just a, a field agent, but a, a leadership role that they, they're playing her up as very bad people skills. Yeah. It, yeah. It, so it's it, it's almost as if she's she's mm, two different people. She's the, the daughter. The, it seems as though the only child, the daughter and getting protected. But, you know, she's also willing to go rogue. Yeah, it was like the whole thing in, in at the beginning of episode five where they have the conversation post heist in the um in the government office in Homeland office, and I I remember very vividly her her response to Raffi in what are you going to do? And her she basically her point of view was, Well, screw the missing arsenal. I must avenge the Mustang that my dad gave me when I was twenty one. That's what matters right now. This is what I'm really pissed off about. The fact that Frank just got a whole arsenal of weapons that he can do what he does with. Yeah, I'll get to that. But for right now, this is where my focus is. And I was like, really? Yeah, are, she are you moved. Really going to go there? Yeah. Well, she seems to move from Kandahar to, um, well, you know, I think that's what starts to get a little bit muddled is because she keeps going back and forth. And we're supposed to, you know, these both these tasks are 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 have similar outcomes. But it, it's it's she she makes these choices um, on a dime of which case she's following when. Yeah, I and I did think the the more the one interesting aspect of that though was in the middle of episode five was the conversation w in the office with her and Karen. Yes, that to bring was, Karen into this. Yeah, that and she, when she start when she she flips on on Karen and and starts to figure out like what if Frank was alive. And something that I kind of personally kind of bothered me, and this is because, you know, both my parents were in the military and I've had a lot of exposure to, you know, law enforcement and uh, those sorts of agencies. A weapons shipment 
is not something you lose. <laughs> right? The, yeah, I they, guess you have like, you know, like four guys guarding it, in, you know, yeah, in a no, van somewhere. No. Like, l- like if, if a shipment like that was stolen, first of all, you would have to have so many weapons that the weapon shipment itself would be irrelevant. And two, literally every agent and cop in the city would have nothing more to do than find that. But it would be... It would be a... Every, like, klaxons everywhere. It's just... No. You, you don't you, just steal... Yeah, Hel- helicopters would be in, in the air. All local police would be blocking roads. Yep. All media outlets would be posting information about it every hour on the hour to say, be on the lookout for anybody packing a small military arsenal of mass proportions. I mean, I don't know if you know, but, like, if, like, a soldier misplaces a rifle, it's a major event. Yeah, this is, this is where, uh, again, grounding reality, sometimes it, it gets a little, a little, a little wonky, because everybody seems to be very, like, even though this shipment was stolen, it's like, uh, we're just going to go ahead and do some bureaucracy on this, and we're going to find out why it happened and who's to blame but we're not going to really actively look for the weapons. But it does result in one of my favorite background items that we get to look at throughout the rest of the next couple episodes, and that's the gun wall. Yes. Because I really want one of those installed. Yeah, straight out of Boondock Saints. Yeah, I, yeah, that, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a beautiful thing. And they actually, I believe there's one shot where Micro's looking at the wall, and then Frank's obviously working on the wall. Um, and... It, now, he, when he's cleaning Micro's gun, do we? Is that when we see the wall for the first time? I think somewhere in there. But it, yeah, that that the, the whole um, uh, scenery is is very indicative of like uh, this is the Punisher we know. This is this is this is the this is the full stream hideout with everything we need. I'll say thanks to their carjacking, they now have the battle van. Yes. I did like the line of demarcation between micro side of the layer and Frank's side of the layer. It's if there's monitors, that's where micro's going to be. If there's guns in the wall, that's where Frank's going to be. And the fact that there are times where you see micro walking by it and you see me just kind of gives a glance at it. And it's that glance, shake of the head of, oh boy, what have I gotten myself into? But, um, no, that whole scene when, when Frank is cleaning the gun for micro, and explaining to him, you know, it's not about show. This thing is, you get the job done with this. And as we find out later on in that episode in particular, that Micro is a guy who is so used to being a desk jockey that he does not get his hands dirty with anything. Whether right. it was doing stuff for in the interest of national security or fixing something in his house so the sink will work right. That wasn't something he did where... Frank is a blue collar, nuts and bolts. I will get in there and do everything that is necessary to get the job done, sort of a guy. So that bouncing back and forth with each other makes it makes that relationship more interesting. But yet Frank can bring that out in him because who was it that T boned Madani? It was Micro. I like that bit before they set out on that raid of where Micro is sitting there and he's having second thoughts about it and Frank just knows exactly which button to push to needle him. And then he says, you know, you're pissed off. Yeah, I'm pissed off. Good. Pissed off beats scared every time. Yeah. Well, and having Micro do that, it also shows the lengths that he will go to because he doesn't want to be dead. He wants to be able to get out of this. And so he may. And I think Frank sees that and says, "Okay, if we're going to do this, then obviously. And I and you've you've been a part of you know getting the cars and you get you've gotten to see death which you haven't seen before. We've got to go a step further, but I I don't trust you with my six o'clock. And so when we go to Kentucky to go visit Gunner, who now this is another 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 piece to the puzzle, which is that Gunner shot that video because he saw, um the heroin uh, baggies being put into the soldiers, so he ha- had an issue with it. But it seems to me Frank should have known it was him straight off the jump because obviously Frank was there in the video. That was uh, that was weird to me that like that only just came out. But again, 
as a story, as a narrative. Uh, you have to kind of piecemeal us into that. Um, but we find out that it was not uh, – Micro got that video from Gunner. Um, and frankly, Frank was right not to trust uh, Micro. Because if you think about it, if Rollins mm. made the new identity offer to Micro instead of Frank, oh. I think Micro would have took it. I think you're right. If, I mean, as long as like it could be given to his family too and you know they could all be together, I think he'd be like, yeah, that's great. I'm out. Which brings into question the the nature of at the beginning of episode four, where they're talking about the concept of leverage. When Frank calls him out, saying, "Well, I've got the leverage on you by saying, you know, I can go see your wife and your kids anytime, so you're going to do what I w- want." But then Micro, as we saw in episode two and episode three, turns the tables on him and basically says, "Look, man, if you want your guns, if you want this arsenal that that you're ranting and raving about." then you're going to help my wife. You're going to help my kids out. Otherwise, the best you're going to do is that stupid pink Ruger. Mm-hmm. Choose. And, I mean, Frank understood this from the go, more go. I mean, I think he didn't trust. That's why he didn't make a play on his morality. He made a play on his family. And, and I've been really surprised in this series of how much time they actually have Frank spend with the family. That's, that was not part I was expecting going into the series was the whole Micro's family interdynamic with Frank. Oh, I, I totally. I mean, on one level, Frank's using it as a leverage point. You know, in fact, he says, I'm going to go visit your wife, you know, and, you know, that has the connotation of, you know, you know where I'm going and <clears throat> it, it could, this could be bad. And I thought, excuse me, <clears throat> I, I really thought that potentially this is where the narrative could go way wrong and have Frank sleeping with Micro's wife. Because I thought, oh, oh that's going to be horrible. This is going to be a CW show now. I don't want that. <laughs> um, and I, I totally, I totally thought for a moment it was going to go there. Yeah, and I would have. It would have been a lesser show if it if it did. Absolutely. And plus the fact that that Micro can see everything. I mean, Frank knows that for for one. Yeah. So it's kind of like maybe he he's, he partly started to do it just to, to kind of cheese off Micro, like you know, ha ha, I'm here with your wife and kids, and you can't be. Mm-hmm. But it's it's more turning back into like like how Frank is like it's getting through his loss of his family. He's kind of like using I don't say using, but he's kind of taken on Micro's family as his family. Oh, it's they're like, definitely it, a surrogate it, it, family. It, it's the same dynamic, you know, the, the, with the, the the age of the kids, the the, the you know, and everything. It's it's just like a, a dual, like a mirror of his family, and he's, I guess, kind of getting out of his revenge shell and sort of just becoming a dad again and a husband again, you know, vicariously through Micro's family. And not to jump past Gunner, but that that leads to the Thanksgiving hallucinations, right? Where he's actually, yes. you know, blending that all together. Frank is the 1970s way of fighting a war and micro is the 2020 version of fighting a war the war of information versus a war of just straight bullets yeah i kind of got the feeling because like frank has some spy craft and some stealth but it's all very physical based right he like he has those skills but they're kind of from a different age if that makes any sense right well i mean he's he, in in many ways he's 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 a marine he is first in first out or first in last out and you know and he even talks about this <clears throat> you know he loved his family but he also loved the marines he loved being in the shit and mm-hmm. it, it, you know that's an interesting play like you know he said even says there, there are times I would have rather been over there than with my family. So he is a very, you know, he's very much a, a, a split animal. And he, I'm amazed at how well he can distance himself from uh, Micro's family. Because it would be very easy for him to kind of, well, I think for most people, to be alone that long. And I think that's, I think that's indicative of the Punisher, which is I can live this kind of lifestyle of... Uh, my family is dead, but I still have my family. And no matter what, even like the the even the the Karen conversations, good gosh, you can tell he would do anything for her. I mean, he smiles with her, and it and he even gave her a peck on the cheek. I mean, these these are he, she. They have such a special bond, but at the same time, he can flip a switch 
and just become, you know, his the alter ego. And, you know, there's Frank Castle and then there's the Punisher. They all have to die mode. Oh. Yeah, that conversation at the table I thought was really great when when it was him and Micro and he and he made no bones about it. And knowing a lot of of people who have been in the service and they've been Marines and having conversations with them, you get that similar vibe of because you have to. You understand that that your unit, while you are enlisted, they are everything. And yes, it is. And, and if I'm, I'm trying to remember the hierarchy, it's it's. Unit core God country is is what if I remember right was how it was uh, for most of the the uh, Marines that I know that's how you have to look at it it's it's you put such an emphasis on that which makes it even more interesting when you flip it around and see what is happening to Lewis in these three episodes and understanding that he is so detached from his home life and and he is so lost that all he sees as his salvation and his way out is to find a way to get back into another unit. And that makes him want to go run to Anvil and figure, okay, if I can go and get back there, then I have meaning again. I have purpose again. Karen gives Frank purpose. Karen gives him something to just say, okay, I'm going to get this done because protecting her is the one thing that is tethering him to one of his last real connections to his own humanity. And how about uh, Rollins' sales pick? For joining the uh, private military group. Wait, Rollins or... Or not Rollins, uh, Russo. Why did I say Rollins? Billy. Billy, yeah. That sales pitch um, where he's talking about how, that, how much they're worth yeah, monetarily. The value. And, yeah. Um, I think that kind of, uh, kind of co- uh, coincides with, with the prior sentiment, you know, that they really do tie up their identity in... in this section of their lives. Oh, something else I just remembered that's kind of funny. Uh, Punisher and Wolverine debuted in the comics on the same year. Both very much anti-heroes. Interesting. Yep. It was definitely the right time period for that. Yeah. So that, that kind of lines yeah. up. Yeah. 1974, both of them. Yep, and if I remember it right, they were, they were both the villains. Yeah, yeah, they were both, both villains to start out. Well, you gotta, you gotta fight, fight your friends first. Well, yeah, no, yeah. Wolverine started out as a Hulk antagonist, and I think Punisher was a Spider-Man. Antagonist. It was, yeah, yep. Because that's when they were drawing him to look almost like you know Count Dracula. It was real weird. It, he had that big bad widow's peak and whatnot. It, it was not my favorite of what Punisher would end up looking like. Um, hey, can we? Let's. I, we've, we were we're kind of dabbling in the waters, and I think it's important to talk about. Um, the fact of Lewis and his value. Um, we talked about the value of a man with, with, with Billy and what your investment is. And Curtis uh, says, you don't want this guy. You don't want this guy protecting you. Uh, he's, he's, he's not ready to go back into combat, which you know sets in motion that he's going to get kicked out of Anvil. He's not going to be recruited. He's not going to push a mop over there because that's not what he's valued at in his mind. And he is on the steps with O'Connor of a courthouse putting out literature for Second Amendment rights, apparently your God-given right. And we find then that O'Connor is not who he says he is. The biggest part about Lewis that I felt horrible about is that he's been he's kind of been lied to. He, you know, he he kind of got was getting pulled under the wing of O'Connor and to find out that O'Connor is this big fraud. And this brings up a really contentious part for me, which is that somehow Curtis has the ability to look into people's records um pretty much with ease. Now, I have not been in the military, um, but it seems like that wouldn't be something somebody could do just because you're a vet. Oh, I'm going to look in this guy's records. No, it's not. I mean, when I was trying to... I've been been working on a project for a long time in regards to my grandfather's uh, history, uh, naval history in World War II. And I've filed Freedom of Information Acts. I have gone to 
um, the Navy itself, and I've said, you know, I'm a journalist. I have, you know, um, this is the project I'm working on. And what I got told was even to get that information was I needed to be the, I had to be the closest living relative to him in order to get the access to the file. So I needed to be my aunt who is now deceased herself. So I've gone back and I've explained that to them and they're like, well, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do because I'm not, uh, I'm not high enough up on the, uh, the family food chain to be able to get the information. I was like, wait a minute, I have to do all this, but Curtis can just go, oh, no, I found it. I got it right here. I kept it in my trunk. I actually bought that entirely because, yeah, through official channels, it would have been hard, but a vet of sufficient rank could relatively easily know the right people to get that done kind of under the... I, I also took it in, that this, in this world that he could use his connections through Billy to get the stuff. Yeah. You know, Billy's got the whole anvil thing going, so... And he didn't get much. He got service date the day he's... Like, when he started serving, it wasn't like... He wasn't... Did I get like his medical history? Or okay, anything? so all right, if if we if we took it just on that alone, um, and obviously there's probably got to be a list somewhere of those who have received silver stars. So, um, I, I maybe I can get around it by saying, okay, oh yeah, if he looks at just the dates of service, he he wasn't in Vietnam, and he also was now a recipient of of a silver star. Right, so so that like that's like his, his only like semi friend at this at this support group. That's you know he kind of like latched onto him. You know he he joined his little you know protest in front of the courthouse to help you know drum up people for Second Amendment rights or whatever. And then when that cop kind of starts you know make you know trying to push him away or, and starting to get get up in their in their face, he he just runs away and and just lets Lewis get arrested and. <sighs> How did anybody feel about the cop saying, "Did you just reach for my gun?" Yeah, I, I, I didn't quite like that. It's, I, I won't say he's like a corrupt cop or, or whatever, but this kind of struck me as like, really, it's like it's just two guys. Like, like, like what they're saying, we're just two guys. You know, here's all our legal rights. We're not doing anything wrong. And he, he's just like, nope, I don't care. You know, I'm going to bust somebody's head today or something. I was just saying, having worked with, around law enforcement and covered criminal cases that have dealt with. Uh, uh, similar situations it is not uncommon to come across police officers who get a full head of i can do whatever the heck i want because i have a badge on my chest and a gun on my hip now the fact that it was a convenient out to have him in that situation and to have lewis get busted because of that that bothered me it was I, I would have rather been through a, another situation other than just, OK, well, we're going to give you the corrupt cop because right now everybody looks at cops as being inherently corrupt. But it, so let me counter that a little bit. They're living in a world that has has had the daredevil run through it, has had half you know a block destroyed by Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, had open warfare of super powered people not too long ago in the Avengers. Uh, and had the whole Luke Cage thing and the Defenders thing going on at the same time. And now a weapons shipment has just been stolen. So I could see, I could actually really easily buy that cops who under normal circumstances would be fine or just way on edge. Okay, I, I, I can, I, yeah, I can, yeah, I can kind of, I can kind of see that. I, I can see it too, but at the same time, if Lewis was more antagonistic, other than, I mean, and that and that's not to say he wasn't because he was. But he was correctly uh, affirming his right to the police officer. He was saying, you know, we're not being violent. We're just standing here. We are using our ability to assemble and, and to protest. And the fact that the cop didn't like it, that he was chipping away at the cop's ego a little bit, and that all of a sudden he went from that to, oh, well, did you just grab my gun? It was like, wait a minute. I'm sure he's not the worst person that that cop dealt with that day either. I mean, he probably had a lot worse guys to deal with than Lewis, who was accurate. I'm not I'm not saying he's right at all. I'm just saying I can see the mindset of somebody standing in a civil monument asking for people to have more guns and not directly succumbing to your authority. I can see that mindset. I'm not saying I agree with it. He obviously acted incorrectly, but yeah. I didn't and, find it and, I didn't and, find and, it and, and, Yeah, and the fact that what was going on at that particular moment in the courthouse was, I, be, I can't remember if we had heard about this 
earlier in the, in the series or not, but it was a oh, it was it was O'Connor talking about it in group um, about I think the teacher that brought a gun into 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 the classroom, and I think and that was the whole that, that was the what was going on inside the court at that particular moment, a very very subplot, but one that. Um, I guess if you, you know, if you've been watching the news, those are kinds of some stories that have been uh, coming to fruition and coming out. Yeah, and even to backtrack it further with Lewis, I mean, if you go to back to the very beginning of episode four, I know you touched on it with the whole thing with Turk, but the episode doesn't start with that. It starts with Lewis digging the hole. That's right. And I thought that Gosh, was really we, interesting because yes. it, it's just him in his backyard digging that hole out. But if you really paid attention to it, I mean, he spends all that time just grinding away to get that thing built and fortified, and then he curls up in his sleeping bag under that tarp. If you look at the the look on his face when he goes to sleep, that looks like a man who's getting finally getting his first peaceful night of sleep in I don't know how long, which plays again back into the whole notion of what people with PTSD go through in having the need for routine, normality, safety. It's safer for him to be out there in the elements in a hole five, six feet in the ground where he doesn't hurt anybody and nobody can get to him than it is to be in his own bedroom 20 feet away. And when Curtis comes and sees him... That was an interesting conversation because you can see Curtis trying to reach out to him, yeah. understanding that, that Lewis isn't buying what he's selling. So what does Curtis do? He goes back to the soldier's approach of, okay, if you're going to be out here, then you need to understand you need to make sure that you dig that's this side of the hole deeper than where you're at because you're going to drown once it starts raining. And I love that audio, I love that audio fade out that, that happens there where, you know, all he hears is all Lewis hears is the jingling of the the dog tags, and yes. he just kind of phases phases out of the conversation there. Yeah, and then when he goes back and visits him in the uh, at the center before the group comes in later on, you know Curtis is genuinely happy to see him, but the fact that or no, this is actually when they're still in the hole when Lewis tells him flat out, talking doesn't work. And that's a very common reaction for people who have dealt with trauma because most of the time, when you're trying, you have so much going on in your head and you have so much going on emotionally that is churning you up. And I, I, I'm in trying to explain this going through my own therapy, my own counseling. It's like screaming in a room full of deaf people. And, and it's not that they, they don't, it's not that, not always that they can't hear you, but it's that they just, you're, you have so much that you're trying to get out that everybody else has to tune you out just to turn it down. So, so coming from, uh, I actually kind of like how they show both Frank and Lewis doing some really physical vis- things um, when they were feeling overwhelmed. Because uh, if you, you know, I, I've researched PTSD a good deal, and what it actually is is, you know, your fight or flight instinct is always on, right? And we're designed that once our flight, fight or flight instinct is triggered that after a lot of exertion it kind of is the signal to turn it down because like if you're you know caveman being chased by a tiger your body expects to run or fight and then you know expects a lot of exertion and then after that it's kind of the signal for the body to cool down so i kind of like the idea that both frank and lewis like did these really physically uh demanding things when they were uh, when they were feeling at their worst yeah, I I totally agree. You know, you 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 see that in like just even people coping with just uh not PTSD but stress in general. They say do something physical it because it gets those uh endorphins and whatnot activated and it kind of pushes some of those those stressors out and it and it's a it's a way of just completely you know you versus you know it, like what it might be even a run whatever but it, it becomes. You know, you can you can turn down the outside world, and when you come back to it, it things are slightly n- normalized in some capacity. Yeah, which is what makes it interesting when he gets to Anvil and you see how he's <clears throat> interacting with the the people that are there. Like that that scene where Billy is kind of watching him, and you see him at the pull up bar with the they don't under they don't identify the guy. I just called him the fat body. Uh, yes, where yes. he's trying to get him to do his pull ups. 
and he's not belittling the guy. He's he's encouraging the guy. He's like, look, man, I've got your back. You need to do this. Okay, if you're not going to be able to do it on your own, you and I go follow me. We'll do it. You know, he still has those same qualities that that made him a good soldier. But the fact that he is as I don't want to say broken, but he's as damaged as he is makes his ability to process everything outside of that equation very, very difficult. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. Yeah. I mean and and, and the sad thing is I, I, I don't want to see Lewis as as this damaged individual, but he you know, these things are he's he's in a very fragile place and then brick and it didn't take very many bricks to be pulled away. First it's Curtis you know, he blames Curtis for, for not letting him join Anvil. And then his one shred of a buddy, O'Connor, uh, bails on him and completely walks away like a coward when the cop comes. And so, you know, the, Lewis decides to go and confront him uh, at his house and can confront him with the truth of, of like, you know, you you. All you have are these stories, and they're 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 not true; they're lies. And so he's 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 kind of it's even more of a shattering point. And O'Connor decides that he's going to not take any more of that and punches him, which then leads into uh, a little K bar brawl, which I wasn't expecting this in the least. And it's probably, I guess, one of the more disturbing points. Uh, that we've that we've seen so far in in the series um, that and and Lewis ends up killing O'Connor. I mean, I, I could kind of see it coming, like when Billy when um, Lewis went to the house and he, he's kind of like all amped up because he just knows that you know O'Connor's entire story is fake. And just just the interaction, I'm like, this is not going to end well. He's he's, he's going to snap and something's going to happen. I, I didn't know it'd be like kind of that gruesome of a snapping but yeah he did you know just lose it at that point it's like you know he's been betrayed his entire life is basically over he's just you know and he, he went off and what it felt like the snapping felt pretty pretty reasonable to me because you know the silver star is a telling medal for him to have uh lied about because it's a medal given for extreme bravery mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh mm-hmm. first of all soldiers of any stripe, do not like it when you claim to have served or won awards that you did not win, right? That that alone is usually enough to get a pretty big reaction out of someone. But to claim that you received a medal of, for bravery and then to run away from a not that dangerous situation, I, I could really see how that just... Yeah, it became inexcusable. Well, and I went back and listened to what it was that um, O'Connor said earned him the Silver Star. And if I remember right, he said he took out 13, and he used the pejorative term, so I'm just going to say combatants, uh, with grenades. And I'm thinking, okay, if you did that, then by most people who would look at it from outside a military perspective, and again, I'm not a soldier, so I don't know the, the, the full breakdown of it, but I'm like, if you did that, then... You'd be saying that, why didn't you just say that you got the Medal of Honor? And I think O'Connor was smart enough to say, well, if I say that, people will be able to call me out on it easier. Whereas if I say I got a silver star, people may not understand the logistics involved in acquiring that. So, I mean, but, silver star is only like two steps below the Medal of Honor. <laughs> sure, but... but and and to the to the layman like me, I can sit there and think, okay, you know, I can I can be critical of it, sure, but the fact that Lewis is so disgusted and rightfully so with what O'Connor had done, and also the fact that he had left him out to dry after filling his head with all these ideas and notions of of this is how you be a patriot nowadays. I could I could completely. Yeah, the visceralness of of that, I can if if anybody looks at it and says, "Okay, the Punisher is blood porn, I'm willing to bet that the greater majority of them points to that scene and says, "See, this is what I'm talking about," without understanding the context at all for why it is. And and really in these three episodes, that is far and away the most violence you get out of all of it. You know, you get the whole scene with the carjacking, that is much more theater of the mind. 
And then everything that, that happens really after that, there's there's no real violence to speak of until you get to this scene with Lewis and O'Connor. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing I could think of offhand was Gunner's traps laid laid at his place, but that I think that's a different 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 scenario altogether. This one on one violence, and I will go a step further in saying that it doesn't. It, I don't believe it's a, a blood pouring situation because you have a. Um, it seems as though Lewis. He's, you know, he doesn't know what to do after this. It's not as if he did this as a malicious thing. It became an accident that, that, and self defense. And then he kind of triggered in him, you know, to repeatedly stabbing O'Connor. And he's, you know, he seems, I wouldn't say sorrowful necessarily. Um, but it's definitely, oh no, what have I done? I did it again. I almost shot my dad and now I've killed this man. You know, I'm a trained killer. I, and, and that's, I see, so I think sometimes people, you know, especially looking at, um, those in the military, you know, you're trained as, 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 as a weapon first. You know, you fall in line and, and you learn how to kill. And so the, the, it becomes, uh, instinctual because you have, it's, it's, you know, kill or be killed. It's life or death situations. And unfortunately, you know, when because Lewis is is so fragile, it happens. And it and I, you know, it, it's I, I look at that not as an exciting form of violence, but very sad because it, it you know, this guy now is kind of hollowed out. He now has like very little emotion left. Yeah. And it goes back to Billy's point in his speech to to, to Lewis and the other applicants at Anvil of. Fighters have no place in a, quote, civilized society, end quote. It's we, we train them, we give them these skills, but once the, the fighting stops and once the war is theoretically over, then you're supposed to come back and forget about all that. And for a lot of, of service people who are, find themselves in a, in a combat theater, you can't. You can't. It, it, it's like that old line from uh, the original uh, First Blood. You can't just turn it off. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite quotes in any movie is from the Serenity, the movie Serenity, the Firefly movie. Okay. Where the operative says, when referencing the perfect world he's trying to build, there's no place for me there. I'm a monster. Ah. Uh, so almost as, a, as if the, this world that I have been in, and I was here before, but then I went out, out, to, out in the country and came back and... and I'm changed and there's no, well, and Frank deals with that, that change. And, you know, where he was at home, but his whole family knew that he wasn't, um, he wasn't there. And, and there were times he didn't want to be there either. It's the Moses can't enter the promised land scenario. Ah, Ooh, wow. Making it biblical. Yeah. Yeah. And that also plays into everything we find out with Gunner. In episode five, which is why he's out there in the middle of nowhere, which impresses Micro that he's completely off the grid. You think yeah, about the, really the lengths does. that people will go to detach themselves from that. And that whole, I, I really loved that whole part of episode five of, of understanding that in order to get to Gunner, you've got to go into his territory and find him. And that he has done something that you could consider more constructive than what Lewis has done. But in some cases you can say it's more destructive because he's totally isolated himself from everything. And just take a second. How amazing just on a cinematography and technical level was that whole sequence into leaves? Oh, it was, it was great. It was and, beautiful. And I'm going to say that, that was one of my favorite takeaways from the whole Gunner episode was, and this is a small thing, but the contrast in the camo, right? That that stood out to me how how Gunner's camo was perfect. Kentucky Woodlands, he was blended in. The the Hit Squad urban camo stood out like a sore thumb, which was perfect for the the drone shots, right? Because they may as well have just been wearing neon. Oh, good looking out, absolutely, yeah, and. That let's let's go ahead and talk about the whole gunner gunner situation for sure. Is the um when going into it, 
Um, Frank's like, look, you know, oh, well, actually, uh, Micro says, I'm coming with you. I'll help drive, whatnot. And Frank was like, no, because I don't, I don't know at what level this guy is at. So I can't protect you. I have to deal with him like by myself, which is, you know, very interesting, kind of sets things up like Gunner may not be, you know, real happy about visitors. Um, but and having immediately, you know, Frank gets shot with an arrow. I mean, that was that was tough. I and mean, I, and I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, you know, I thought, you know, sure, it's going to be a few arrows like hit and miss. But to just to tap into him, I was like, woof. But that whole the whole sequence of of information and and action at the same time, I thought was super cool. And I did also I- the the funny part with meal rations uh, <laughs> as they're going to Kentucky. Uh, Frank gets his little uh, tuna fish casserole in a bag, and Micro pulls up this big ass hoagie. I thought was just super special and again building that that inf- the 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 relationship between the two yeah he tells him yeah, i thought you liked that the, yeah like, like, like look on frank's face it's like you, you, you got a sandwich and he's like well it, 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 it was all in the fridge man <laughs> well i mean i think it goes to the fact that even on a subconscious level frank doesn't mm-hmm. allow himself any comfort or luxury yes well, and it was a great callback to the sandwich in the first episode, right? When he was sitting on the rooftop and the, the kid came up and offered him his sandwich. So, oh, well, yeah, and also the good callback. And, and also the bits of levity in, in episode two where, uh, where they're at the diner with the whole hipster thing. It was, I did like that, that again, because you're, you're dealing with such heavy stuff over the span of these three episodes. But even though they took, I mean, and that whole scene in the, in the van is what? Two three minutes tops, but that's that was all that was needed to to kind of ground these guys and and just give you a little bit of oh yeah these are two guys that that when they need to they don't need to be big badasses they can kind of just joke around with each other and and then okay well fine now it's back to work but and you don't always need dialogue sometimes it's just a look and that gives enough of a story you know a, a, enough of us narratively to understand these characters. Yeah, and the fact that Micro is sitting there eating that big hoagie thinking, Frank could kill me right now. I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm eating, I'm, I'm scared eating my dinner. I, or at least I'm not scared, but I'm nervous eating my dinner because I've, I've, I've made Frank unhappy and I don't know what's going to happen now, but I may get a beating. He may shove a K-bar through my neck. I don't know, but I'm going to eat my dinner because damn it, I'm hungry. <laughs> and it, and it or, pays off later when he's sitting in the woods hiding the van, and he's just kind of sitting there reading a book, munching on the sandwich. But yeah, the the whole thing with him going into the woodlands to find um, Gunner, the other thing I did like about it was the only music that you hear throughout that whole sequence is the occasional just strum of an acoustic guitar. There's a, I don't know what the track is, but it's there for about 30, 40 seconds, and then it's gone. And then you're just right back into the full sensory understanding of you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're trying to find a guy who doesn't want to be found. And yeah, Frank sticks out like a sore thumb because he's all in black, but the fact that he still thinks he can reach Gunner, and when he turns around and gets that arrow right in the shoulder... And yeah, that did come out of nowhere. And I did. I love the fact that when he finally gets through to Gunner, the first thing Gunner says to him is, sorry, I shot you, bro. And Gunner and Frank just looks at him like, "Ah, what are you going to do? Yeah, I would have done the same thing. I got it. Yeah, Um, that whole the whole and and that other just the the fire team, like the attention to detail, like we're talking about, like uh, the camouflage and his shoulder is hurt. He has an arrow in his shoulder, and when the firefight starts, I love the fact that, and I didn't get it at first. I was like, "Why is Frank holding the gun that way?" And to realize, oh, it's because your your arm's completely roached, and he's using you know his arm as best as he can to um to to maintain the sights. I th- I thought was great. And Rollins sitting back overseeing the yeah. whole thing from his laptop, 
there was so much I liked about how that whole scene was constructed, right down to the fact that, and and I love the fact that you have these uh, the ability to do this now. I mean, again, five, ten years ago, they wouldn't have been able to do this, or at least not to the same extent where, you know, you see things from the soldier's perspective. So, I mean, really, it's a GoPro shot on a on a guy's shoulder, or the drone shots overhead. The fact that, that you don't need to have a, a big helicopter flying in and getting those shots anymore, and you have micro there providing the real-time surveillance with his drone that is just sitting there. And I remember looking up at the, they, they panned up to the trees and you can see it hovering there, but you can't hear it. And the fact that, that they're able to give you both from a scenery perspective, what you're able to get from being at that height, looking down at what's happening, but also providing a tactical advantage for Frank where micro can tell him, okay, you know, when they're behind that, that fallen tree and he says, you know, you got two guys and you're five and you're seven, you got two guys coming ahead of you. You got to take the guys behind you out first. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in a crossfire and they're going to be there in 10 seconds. It's the OK. Now you understand what the stakes are and it's all unfolding in real time. I loved that part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and something I just realized just now, how, how funny is the contrast between the metal that was not earned, but talked about, and the medal that cannot be talked about, but was earned. Ooh. Damn you. <laughs> oh, he's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Rollins gets gets this award um, with the super clandestine... Well, I, I can't remember exactly what the, the award is, um, but basically it's job well done, but uh, this goes away. You, you you don't you don't get to keep it, um, but it's going to be remembered. Um, yeah, it seems like Rollins Distinguished Intelligence Medal. There it is. And so this also kind of we start to learn a little bit more about Rollins. Uh, what? Well, we learn that he is Rollins because he introduces himself to what looks to be a CIA class. Um, maybe uh, getting spooled up and their first day on the job onboarded, um, talking to the boss. And then we realize that, well, Rollins himself has a boss and he has been being tapped, um, for a deputy director position because, uh, everybody's moving up a little, up the chain slightly and is asked point blank, is there anything that we need to know about any, any, um, any uh, Kuleshov's, or I shouldn't say Kuleshov's, um, Chekhov's um, background skeletons. that is going to, skeletons that are going to hurt us later. Oh, no, 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 no. Nothing like that. Super clean. And that's the catalyst for the hit squad. Yeah, and then going back to like the, the body cam footage, when, when Rollins sees that Frank's live, he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, when Rollins sees he's- him, and it's, boy, talk about um, where possibly some Mr. Robot um camera shots were used we literally see rollins eye in the lower left corner of the frame and th- of uh, of the of his of him viewing this and it's just like wow that i that was a that was an interesting shot choice which i loved but it was definitely like oh shit it's frank he's alive oh totally any any opportunity to start integrating mr robot type of cinematography into into media nowadays uh, i'm i'm totally in favor of that uh where to next we're oh yeah i don't know if this plays in i when micro and uh frank are in the in the van talking about cerebus and he starts going into the whole background of cerebus and his operation spot the dog yeah operation spot the dog do you think that was just all kind of just filler in there or should we should we have gleaned something more out of that i think it was just nervous chatter okay it was it was setting up micro's character and how he's going to look for a way to to bring frank to a a level that he can feels like he's got a little superiority at you know reducing his operation to spot the dog Right. Okay. Okay. I I just I I had it in my notes, and I just wanted to to throw it out there. It it is the bureaucratic mentality that anytime you are in a war scenario, you have to give whatever operation you're on this big macho 
badass name. It's Operation Rolling Thunder. It's Operation Cerebus. And when you break it down and have somebody say, actually, your operation is Spot the Dog, it, it, it does kind of take you down a peg. It mm-hmm, is one of those mm-hmm. of, of, really? You're, you're going to go there? But to somebody who likes, like Micro, who I'm sure looks at, at Frank's methodology and his way of doing things sometimes going, dude, chill the hell out. To to, <laughs> you th- to just you think give too him much. to give him that little jab, just to say, you know, I understand this is a, a terrible thing for you, but think about it this way: you were part of Operation Spot the Dog. Yeah, deal with that. Yeah. If if you say it's grand tradition of kind of wacko mm-hmm. operation names, um, if you ever want to read something stranger than fiction, look up Operation Midnight Climax. Whoa. It's a thing that happened. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, That's sure, in the show notes. I'm sure it has. <laughs> um, well, I guess that beats Operation Fluffy Puppy, so, yeah. Yeah. Operation Northwoods, all those others. Uh, uh, it, come, uh, it, to close off uh, Episode 5, Frank is barely hanging on, and Gunner is now dead and wanted to be buried. But this kind of does show us a couple different things. Uh, one is that Micro can be very, very clutch. Um, to He was actually saved Frank's life uh, and went out to the woods, which he kind of didn't think. But, like, there was this whole part where, like, he doesn't know how to carry a guy out of the woods. And I, after rewatching this, you know, they really show a lot of time passing between him trying to get Frank on his shoulders. Well, and especially since we had just seen Frank lug Gunner, what, a couple hundred feet after he'd been Easily. shot and stabbed. And, and what does Frank do? Frank just grabs him, hauls him up, and just drags him. And then you immediately juxtapose that with micro in the exact same situation but he's not frank so you see him struggling it's the it's the complete okay now i have to be frank but i can't be frank but i still gotta do this because i gotta save frank yeah he's he's my missile i mean again it's symmetry we had a little earlier uh frank being the fish out of water in micro's world now micro gets to be the fish out of water in frank's yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I do. I love the fact that when we get to episode six, that, and this is not to say that I have, uh, I am anti Rosario Dawson in any way, shape, or form, because I have loved her through the entirety of the MTU. But I like the fact that they went to Curtis, and that we don't have Claire, the night nurse, have to step in on this one. I'm glad she gets a break because. Throughout Daredevil, throughout Iron Fist, throughout Luke Cage, she has been the constant there, but she wasn't in Frank's world. But I could have seen an opportunity to bring her in, but I'm very glad that they had the restraint not to. And it was, okay, Curtis is the corpsman, he knows how to fix this, and then you get the meatball surgery scene with Curtis's calm and Micro trying again not to leave his DNA for the police to find. Yeah... I think after they shoved uh, Rosario Dawson into Iron Fist in the most ham-fisted way possible, <laughs> I think they learned their lesson. And, and having uh, Micro go get Curtis did bring up one other interesting thing I saw, which was it shows that Curtis is still a little broken himself because he still sleeps with the 1911 under his pillow. So, you know, he's still got a ways to go on getting himself healed. Mentally. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great call. And... Well, and he's and he's ready to go on a moment's notice. Like he obviously had his 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 field kit ready to go. You know, he's always active. He's re- you know, it's like like kind of once in the military, always in the military. Certain routines just aren't broken. Right, got to have that go bag. Yeah, and I did like that. Um, yeah, and especially later on in that episode with Curtis when he's with the group and he talks about Cassius the goat. I thought that uh, did a yeah. really. I thought that did a lot to really flesh out Curtis's character and understanding, you know. And obviously, you get the parallels with Frank, but 
I, I like that interjection where it, it humanizes Curtis a little bit more and, and explains how he is the antithesis of, especially in that scene, the antithesis of O'Connor, where, you know, the he's not a bitter, cynical, angry person. He still understands what he did and why he did it, but that that his humanity is so crucial to him, especially being a corpsman where his job is to save people on the field. And now he's trying to save Frank by proxy and trying to save Lewis and trying to save the other guys in that circle. And at the end of the conversation, he tells them he doesn't have any answers. Yeah, nothing, nothing tied up in a neat ribbon um, and bow at all. You know, it, it's, it's the questions of, I don't know what we, where we go from this. I can only tell you what has happened and kind of how I've dealt with it. That's it. And, it, and, and the goat thing. I wasn't ex- I well, obviously the title of this episode is Judas Goat and I you know I didn't know how that was going to going to fit in at all um but that that parallel to Frank you know the goat died just it couldn't it couldn't you know keep going you know being beat on and 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 hurt and eventually it died and you you know, that that strong parallel to Frank you know you think uh, is he going to is he not we we knew he's not obviously but you know, it it did give um, per, some perspective on how much can a man take, and, and the kind of parallels Lewis's journey too. Like you know, Lewis just kept getting piled on and piled on, and disappointed and betrayed, and then he finally snapped at the end. He couldn't take any more. Uh, yeah, big time. That's a, that's an excellent point. Does anybody have a problem with uh, Raven? This is Blackbird on the radio. Yep. I did. It was, as soon as the first time I heard it, I went, wait a minute, that's not Richard Crenna. Uh, that, that, it, it's interesting how much the writers, and, and, I, and I can look at it from the perspective of being older and, and having watched all these movies and being really interested in, the, in a soldier's world growing up. Because every kid, to an extent, I mean, we were all playing with army men when I was a kid. Um, you know we're fascinated by that sort of thing but but when they turned it on and all of a sudden it's blackbird to raven i went no 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 no. it's company commander calling raven that that's the line i was like wait a minute i mean i i would have liked a little bit more originality on that one i would have liked a different uh, even a different call sign or something but i was like wait a minute this isn't the sylvester stallone flick and, and frank castle is not rambo so come on guys you can do better than that yeah, I I just I think for me it wasn't so much what was said as that fact that Billy is out on a radio now doing that. And it didn't seem it the payoff wasn't there like why would he be calling for Frank like that? Um I guess because you know he thinks that he potentially may be still alive. I mean that the the the, ele- the it the question is now out there between he and Madani. And I just, it was just weird. It's like, you know, there's a really low fidelity uh, technology, and I get that. It just, it just seemed, it just didn't click with me quite right. No, what it I... It wasn't as good as flowers in the window. Yes. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, 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 oh. For, it, let's see. Because Frank kind of gets better a little quick. And we have the scene where Frank is, no, no, I'm sorry. Mm-mm. Next that. Uh, I was thinking about the family of snitches and traitors. Do we want to get into that? Yeah, I think it's worth getting into with the Liebermans because we haven't really touched on them too much. And, and it was interesting how even from the start of this block where you're seeing, especially through Micro's eyes, as he's again relegated to what is happening on the... Um, you know what's that? he can see through his monitors, and you get that voyeuristic need to always keep an eye on his family versus the understanding of why well, I need to keep them safe. But the fact that out of all three of the people in that house, that Leo, the daughter, seems to be the most mature and the most adult, because while her mom Sarah is coping in her own way, she's coping through absenteeism, and Zach calls her out on it. You know, the fact that when when um, Frank is invited over to dinner and the first thing Zach says is like, oh, you're actually going to cook something. I can't. I when did that happen? Um, 
and but Leo is the one who's trying to maintain the order in the house. She's the one fixing the sink. She's the one that's helping Frank fix the car. That she's the one who's the most engaged in all this. Whereas you have the polar opposites of Sarah and Zach, who are both trying to cope and they're both hurting, but they're both doing it in equally and potentially destructive ways. Mm-hmm. Well, but but that's her coping method. It's equally destructive. She's just because she's taking more on than a than a person her age should i mean she's oh absolutely she's forcing herself into that role and it's still a, a bad coping mechanism but they're all broken people i mean that's kind of the theme of the show right broken people yeah and if you see the way frank just the way he interacts with her and addresses her and you know just the way he talks to her he's very much viewing her as a surrogate daughter yeah i mean i don't think i i, I think to, to read that scene any other way it would be disingenuous i mean it, it's clearly he's he's got an affinity for this family and is it just because it's it's Micro's family? I kind of think not. I think I think there no, he it does feel a void. And when you go back to the conversation he has with Karen at the at the waterfront when he's talking about the painting that his son put on the wall of the Marine and how yes. you know he he says you know Frank Jr. was he was only eight and and what does Frank do? He walks in and he sees it and at first he's like wow that was really it was really good. And and he's emphasizing that point to Karen, but what does he still end up doing? He drags him out on the front lawn, puts a finger in his face, and said, what were you doing? And you can see that Frank looking at, at David's son, Zach, and I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm wa- Especially when the first time he walks by and he just rams him with his shoulder, and then when he hears that, his, that Zach punched Leo, and he's just so visually just just lashing out at every opportunity he can get i'm waiting for frank to just turn around and grab him right by the the collar and just like hoist him up and go kid knock it off but at the same time we see frank is at the point where through his own experiences back on the ferry and in that conversation with karen that he knows he can't do that anymore that doesn't help things so i'm i'm going to be curious to see going forward over the next seven episodes how frank deals with that particular dynamic because in your mind that has to be dealt with obviously zach is in in a in a a kind of in a world unto himself and um i will say uh i think you you will you, you will see that happen well and i think that part of that shows how much worse he took what they said about his dad than the rest of the family yeah, you know, the rest of the family's broken by the loss, but his his statement of you know snitches and traitors shows that he's taken to heart that what they said about his dad and that that he believes it. Yeah, ah, two ways of looking at it. Like you know, you can either defend him or you know this this is actually what my my family's like. We're getting down to the the kind of the the, the final part of six, which is Frank doesn't go. To he, he has the option. Russo is going to. He said, "Look, get out of here. I can ship you anywhere you want. I can set you up with a new identity. I can, you know, move you out." And Frank doesn't show up. And we find then Russo's like, you know, looking at his watch, doing indicative things of it's it, he's not going to show up. And he gets in the car, and there we have Agent Orange, aka Rollins. And all I'm saying is, damn you. And and does Frank not showing up, does that loop back to what he was, the conversation he was having with Micro's wife and the statement that he thinks he's found something better to uh, latch on to? Does he have a, a mission now that he can't walk away from? I think so. Right? Well, that it's was- it's interesting because Frank has to know that there is no end game from him, for him. Even if he wins everything, he's still the subject of a nationwide manhunt. <laughs> And he still doesn't have a family. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. he, he still doesn't have very much. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think he's latched on to where, what does he do after yet. And that's, that's what I'm wondering if we're starting to get to. Has he found a new mission, life mission? You know, is he going to become the Punisher and actually, you know, after this, is he still going to go at it? Or is this, you know, does he still see this as the end? So are you, are you, are you kind of presupposing that basically Frank is not yet the Punisher? Like... All, everything that he's been doing up into this point, and I will, I'm, I, I'm, I'm playing 
advocate to your to your role here, which is everything he's done is um, personal in nature. It's not him doing something um, because it's you know. Because it's the superhero thing to do, uh, you know, the slaves getting mugged or whatever, and he finds the call to the hero to to do something about it. All of these things seem to lead to him in some capacity. Right. Yeah, I, I, th- I take it as everything that he's had at this point has been a focus on the mission of revenging his family. He yeah. just has, a, has continued that fight. I, I think he hasn't still, stepped outside of that role. Yeah, I think I think you're it's still that. But the addition of micro has has n- this this is a side thing that we're actually he can make things right for him and in fact he says to sarah i think things are going to really look up for you soon and that tells me at least the way i read it is that frank is trying to get daniel back with his family and he yeah, wants but- that and at the same time if you backtrack to the conversation again that he had with karen karen calls him out on that Say, where does this end for you? What when this is all done? What are yeah. you going to be, Frank? What are you going to do? Now, Karen doesn't have the the benefit of knowing that that Frank is connected to uh, to Micro's family and that he's got that sub story going on. There's that distance of, of of knowledge there, but she looks at Frank the same way we are of what what is going to happen with him when this is done, and. Frank, I I know that he's looking at at what is happening with the Liebermans, thinking, okay, this is for me. It's a chance for him to make things right that he obviously did not get with his family, you know. And and he again, he outlines that of I lost my family because of who I am and what I did. That cost me that. He has an opportunity to make things right with David and his family, and he's gonna do that. So obviously he's not going to look at Sarah and say, well, you know, you just have to do the best you can. If he can do anything to influence it, to make it so David can come home and be in a part of that life again and get his life back, then Frank will do that even up to, if it means I would imagine, sacrificing himself to do it, because at least that way they both get the peace that they want. I will say that I kind of, well, I think Frank became the Punisher about halfway through Daredevil season two, that scene where he's in the witness stand on trial and he's supposed to play ball. And then he just like, you know, gives his litany against evil or whatever. Um, I think that's the moment when Frank opted out of society and decided that he could be a higher, like he could make things right much better than the system could. And I think he became the punisher in that moment. But unlike Batman who became Batman and Batman still meant the same thing forever. I think what, it like what his I suppose mandate as the Punisher is is evolving and expanding. Right, the mission's not set yet. Uh, yeah, but I think yeah, Batman seems to be always Batman thinking in a Batman way. I it seems as though Frank is not always the Punisher. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's like a theory I've always heard that that Bruce Wayne is the mask for Batman. Whereas Punisher is the mask. That's not a theory. That's explicitly stated. No, it, it is. <laughs> no, it totally is. And, and if you watch the Nolan films, it, it completely codifies that. But with Frank, it is w- with. Can I just interject real quick? Sure. Just on point, there was an amazing uh, Batman Beyond where uh, somebody was trying to make Batman think he was uh, going crazy by talking out of the voice in his head, and kept telling him, "Bruce, do this. Bruce, do that." And at the end, he's asked, how did you know it was fake? And he's like, I don't call myself Bruce. Ah, uh, see, I, I, huh. I'm not that well-versed in Batman Beyond, so I would have missed that one. But, you know, the, to, to Moses' point, yeah, I mean, it's... Frank is, is different in that regard in that he's trying to at least have some form of humanity still to tether himself to. The problem is, is that as long as he has these injustices that is are going on around him and as long as his own pain has not been satisfied by getting the people who caused it then the punisher is a necessity and it's and and he is the antithesis of Rollins in that but they're both rather machiavellian in their goals i mean Rollins is is completely machiavellian in everything he has done to this point and frank can appreciate that because you have to be 
to some extent, to win a war. You have to understand that you're going to get your hands dirty, but the ends have to justify the means. If it means at the end of it, you're raising your flag and you can say, I won. Is there anything out there that we want to cover, um, like some finalizing thoughts, uh, just to make sure we got everything out that we needed to get out? I, I don't know that it fits in anywhere, but the fact that Micro can jam out on a guitar was pretty funny. Uh, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, good qual- good call there. I thought he couldn't play guitar. Yeah, that's what he told Frank. <laughs> that's exactly what he told Frank. Yep, that that was an interesting spot, too, where all of a sudden you come back and he's there and he's strumming. And I was like, wait a minute. My final thoughts are uh, simply that all that guitar playing gave me acid flashbacks to that really weird song in the 2004 movie. I need to go back and look at that movie. I've, I've just purged that one. I don't remember it. Yeah. A bad guy basically rolls up to him, plays a song for him on the guitar, oh, sings a little bit, and then pulls right. out. Oh. Yeah, the musician. I remember. <laughs> okay. Now I remember. That had been in long-term storage, but now I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that movie could have been good. <laughs> Very much so. But no, I, I mean, with these three episodes, again, I think this was the opportunity for the writers to flesh out the world that you're going to have to really be immersed in for the next seven episodes. It gave the the secondary characters a chance to to build themselves up. The emphasis was not always entirely on Frank. Uh, it gave Micro more things to do. It gave Madani more things to do. It gave Lewis more things to do. And now it's going to be interesting to see as we roll into the second half of this series how all these threads are going to be tied together, who's going to do what, how things are going to pan out. And ultimately, now that we understand that it's going to be Frank and Micro versus Rollins and Billy, how is that all going to end? Yeah, the the Billy and and Rollins team up revelation, which we kind of felt coming, but now it's confirmed, is going to be a big part going forward. And I can't wait to see how they play that out. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah, I mean, like I said before, like you know, these three episodes, you know, just keep building on the characters, you know, getting us, you know to even care more about them than we did in the first three. And now it's, it's, yeah, all the pieces are in place. We know who all the players are. And now it's like, you know, now let's, let's take it the next step of let's get into it. Let, let's end it. Let's try to get back to our normal lives. If we can, after all this is over. It's so nice to care about the characters and not feel as though they are just puppets and, and, and these little pieces to, to drive the narrative forward. It's, it's, it's nice to be able to say, hey, this person is my favorite character. Oh, really? This is a person that's mine. You know, and, and to know that they all have, uh, we, we've seen and, and heard, you know, these little bits of character that they, that they actually have, these, this, that they are somewhat flesh. And speaking of cast of characters, I want to thank Devin, Eric, Jason, and Sean for joining me again for uh, putting our entries down in the Punisher War Journal. I am, again, super excited about this show. And if you're not watching it, and I know there are a few people that are listening to this, but not watching the show, and I say to you, uh, give it a shot, please. And don't miss. Right. Right.